I grew up on the south side of Chicago. My family are all union members, labor activists, steel workers, railroad workers, pipe fitters, iron workers. So I grew up in that background. My great grandfather was in the little steel strike of 1937 where they had six people who were murdered. And so that sort of educational background was very prevalent in my own upbringing. He often told the story growing up that he had a Chicago police officer stick a pistol in his mouth and ask him if he was a communist. And so with that background, my dad became somewhat radicalized as well, organized in the labor, labor movement, mainly with local iron, local one, which is the main local of iron workers in Chicago. He was in the army during Vietnam. Uh, he got out, became an activist. In 1968, he was in Grant Park in Chicago. It was a particularly brutal uh, portion of American history, um, not to mention the fact that the FBI and many of the governmental organizations at that time had cracked down on the Black Panthers, the American Indian Movement, and also the Vietnam Veterans Against the War. A big portion of the anti-war history that's been forgotten in America had been the impact that the anti-war veterans had. And 1971, there was over 35,000 members of Vietnam veterans against the war. There were major actions taking place, not only back home on military installations in the United States, but also servicemen and women who were taking it upon themselves to refuse combat orders while in Vietnam, and or many of whom decided to what we call frag their commanders, uh, kill people who were in their higher command, refuse orders. Uh, by 1971, there had been a major race riot on every single military installation in Vietnam. Um, so the armed forces, by the end of the Vietnam War in 1975, were quite literally falling apart. Uh, that being said, with that background, I joined the military even though my father had warned me not to join, uh, particularly in light of 9-11. I was a senior in high school, so we watched 9-11 happen on TV. The climate and the atmosphere in the United States at that point was very scary. There was a lot of jingoism, a lot of racism, the general attitude towards those from the Middle East, Muslims, Arabs, and so forth, was very rigid and was very radical. Uh, it was uh, very toxic. To some, to some degree, I think I sort of felt like that wasn't a duty to go. Uh, but I did feel as though I wanted to be a part of what was happening at that time. And I think in a very ignorant way, being a 17-year-old kid who thought he knew everything, um, I joined the Marine Corps. I joined as an infantryman and a machine gunner. I finished my school of infantry training a month before the initial invasion of Baghdad in 2003. And so I was in Iraq during that portion. And during the second deployment, in Al Qaim, which is in the Al Anbar province of Iraq, about five miles south of the Euphrates and about two miles uh, east of the Syrian border. Uh, we spent most of our time patrolling, uh, doing house raids, uh, prisoner detention, uh, things of this nature. Uh, and during that part of my experience is when I became, I think, a little more self-conscious of what was happening. Uh, many of the people in Iraq that we were occupying had told us that obviously they didn't want us in their country anymore. They didn't want us there to begin with. And the American forces were conducting some very brutal actions. Uh, most of the prisoners we took in were tortured. There was a lot of shooting of civilians, uh, a lot of massacring of civilians, a lot of things that weren't on the daily news or the nightly news in America. And through those processes, I decided individually that I was no longer for the war, uh, that I could no longer support the war effort. Uh, so when we rotated back to the States, they had told me that they were going to send me on a third deployment to Iraq, and I refused to go. Uh, at that point, my command administratively discharged me from the Marine Corps. After that happened, I came home and found out about an organization called Iraq Veterans Against the War, uh, which is made up of servicemen and women who've served since 9-11 and are opposed to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. We have four very basic principles for the organization. Uh, one and two is immediate withdrawal from Iraq and Afghanistan. Three, 
is reparations for the people of Iraq and Afghanistan for the destruction and death caused for the last 10 years, if not, of course, as many of you know, uh, through the sanctions in the 1990s, hundreds of thousands killed in Iraq. Um, in the 1980s, of course, our support uh, of various militant groups within Afghanistan. Those are our basic principles, and also full benefits in medical care for returning servicemen and women who have served in Iraq and Afghanistan. With that, uh, we've been organizing around the United States with the anti-war movement. And the anti-war movement in the United States was, I think, quite potent and quite powerful and in large in numbers. Uh, however, I think we, our inability to create political power to stop Bush in particular and the Republicans was sort of filtered into the Obama election in 2008. So a lot of what happened was this, you know, sort of upwelling and swelling of support and organizing uh, that was then filtered into this electoral process. During that time, it's, and since then, it's been extremely difficult to get the anti-war movement up and rolling again in the United States. I should also add sort of a caveat to that. When the financial collapse took place in September, October of 2008 in the United States, that shifted most people's attention to economic issues, home foreclosures, things like this. And it's been very difficult, I think, for a lot of folks to make the connection uh, between military spending and military empire and imperialism abroad and the fact that at home we're having schools fall apart and roads are falling apart and uh, labor unions are under attack and so on and so forth. And so throughout that period and still till today, uh, we've been organizing on active duty bases around the United States. We have uh, four different bases that have Iraq Veterans Against the War chapters on the base in the United States. We've set up coffee houses and GI magazines uh, that are sort of resistance anti-war magazines that we publish on university campuses and then also on uh, cafes and so forth that we have set up outside of the active duty military installations. But it's also been very difficult to organize in that capacity because it's an all-voluntary force. Uh, it's much different than it was during Vietnam with the draft. And during Vietnam, you had hundreds of thousands of people who wouldn't have otherwise had served or joined to serve. And right now, with the economic situation in the United States, it's very difficult to ask young men and women not to join the service because the service in the United States provides uh, free education and free health care. For folks in the United States, health care costs are absolutely ridiculous. As many of you know, we have over 60 million people who are uninsured uh, and can't find health insurance that's affordable. Half of all bankruptcies in the United States are due to health care costs. Um, so you have a segment of society, particularly from the African American and the Latin American communities, who feel as if their only way out uh, is to join the service. And as I'm sure most of you know as well, in the United States, most students are now tens of thousands of dollars, if not well over $100,000 in debt from student loans. So that's the situation in terms of trying to, I think, persuade young folks in the United States to not join the services. We don't have a lot of other options right now. And the economy is such to where, you know, to ask someone to go work for $7.25 an hour, which is our minimum wage, um, is it's very difficult. It's very difficult. The problems with returning servicemen and women, we have well over 150,000 veterans who are homeless in the United States. Close to one-fourth to one-fifth of the homeless population in the United States is made up of veterans. One-tenth of our prison population, which as many of you know is the largest in the world at 2.5 million prisoners, one-tenth of those are servicemen and women. Um, one third to one fourth of all females who are getting out of the service are reporting military sexual trauma or rape. So one third of women who are serving in the armed forces are being sexually assaulted or raped by their fellow servicemen and women. Not to mention, um, we have 18 veterans a day who are killing themselves. We've had more veterans commit suicide in the last five years than have died in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, so there's been well over five, 6,000 veterans who've committed suicide just in the last six years. Uh, the unemployment rate for veterans right now hovers around 
for African American and Latin American veterans, that number jumps to about 30 to 40 percent. So all of the same sort of disparities that you find in American society where the black and brown communities are far more impoverished than the white communities are, uh, except for rural white communities. You have a situation where also when they're coming home as veterans, they're going back to that same socioeconomic community that they're coming from. The difficulties and the challenges are much different depending on the demographics with the veterans. So for instance, uh, Latin American and African American veterans only make up 26% of the armed forces, but they make up 56% of the homeless population amongst those in the armed forces. Uh, so in a lot of ways, the military and what's happened with veterans is sort of a microcosm of what's happening in American society as a whole. Uh, all of that being said, we're dealing with an extremely traumatized community of veterans, many of whom, myself included, have been on multiple tours of duty. Uh, the folks that I work with uh, oftentimes had served three, four, five, six different times in Iraq or Afghanistan. And once someone comes home from something like that, um, they are forever changed. Uh, and it's something that we don't talk about in American society. We have this very sort of chest-beating patriotism when we want to go to war or when we promote the military or encourage people to join the service, but then when these veterans are coming home, of course, there's no services and they're cutting the budget for the Veterans Administration, which is sort of the overarching uh, medical institution that takes care of veterans when they get home. So to move away from all of that negative information, um, we have found that in the last five years, particularly since the financial collapse, there's been an upsurge of activism in the United States. Okay, so we have the Occupy movement, we have several labor organizations and labor unions who have been now organizing, I think, more in a, I would say, radical way than they have in the past. Um, it's been very difficult in the United States, especially since 1980, and of course the Thatcher and Reagan revolutions um, have absolutely destroyed the labor movement in the United States right now, only 11.7% of our workforce is unionized. Um, so that's been a big issue. We've been working with veterans and the labor movement since then, trying to connect the issues of austerity with a military budget that, if you include nuclear weapons and if you include veterans' health care, hovers around a trillion dollars a year in the United States. So as I think most of you know as well, the United States spends on its military what the rest of the world spends combined. That's something that still is very difficult to talk about in American society because there's millions of jobs that are tied to the military industrial complex. And so now you have a situation where the economy is tanked, people want jobs, people know that the wars are bad, but now they don't know what to do. So there's the paradox with regards to military spending, at least one of the paradoxes. I will say that someone in the room had mentioned Bradley Manning earlier. There are a lot of actions and support for Bradley Manning amongst servicemen and women in our organization and also organizations like Veterans for Peace. Right now we have about 3,000 members in Iraq Veterans Against the War. Uh, we have chapters in every state in the United States and then as I had mentioned, we also have uh, chapters on active duty basis as well. And each chapter operates in a very autonomous fashion. So folks in San Francisco, for example, are working on mainly issues surrounding Bradley Manning. Uh, whereas the chapter in Chicago, where I'm from, uh, we've been starting a campaign with the local nurses union in order to have the VA hospitals better staffed and better manned and funded and so on and so forth. And not to mention the folks who are working in the Veterans Administration hospitals are being asked to work ridiculous hours for low pay. Many of the nurses aren't even trained to deal with people who have PTSD. And the answer from the United States government and from the VA has been to shell out pills to everybody. So right now, for example, in Afghanistan, 17% of those who are in the combat zone are currently on psychotropic medications. Uh, about one-fifth of those who are serving in Iraq are on some kind of antidepressant, sleeping pill, anti-anxiety pill. Um, 
when I came home from Iraq, their answer was to give me uh, sleeping pills, uh, antidepressant pills, anti-anxiety medication, and then in the morning a, a speeder so I could sort of get up and do stuff during the day and then in halfway through the day uh, anxiety pills, antidepressant pills, and then sleeping pills at night to go to sleep. Um, I eventually refused that treatment as well. I found that uh, smoking a joint works a lot better for me. Um, and, and so, and that, well, okay, on a positive side, I've been mentioning all, this negative th all these negative things. That is something that has actually had a lot of support amongst the veterans community in the United States is the legalization of marijuana. Now, I know usually that's talked about in this sort of boutique cultural activist way, oh, it's nice to just have weed legalized. But for millions of veterans who are coming home, um, it's a much different story. Because instead of being pumped with tons of psychotropic medications, a lot of veterans have now taken it upon themselves to join the campaigns for the legalization of marijuana or, and or at least for medical use. Uh, and now the VAs in several states within the United States are allowing veterans to take that uh, as medication. They won't prescribe it, but they won't get you in trouble if you, you know, uh, have to take a uh, urine test or something like this, a drug test. I was just mentioning the Occupy movement. Most of what we've done in the last two years has either happened in conjunction with the Occupy movement or in conjunction with the labor movement. So I was mentioning to Nick that I had been in, not only in Zuccotti Park in New York when the Occupy movement started, but then also uh, we were in Madison, Wisconsin, and that was a very powerful experience. Uh, there's 115, 120,000 people who literally occupied the Capitol building in Madison, Wisconsin, and we felt like it was our building for two weeks. I must say that that was probably one of the more empowering experiences I've ever had. Uh, however, as I mentioned with the 2008 election, a lot of what happens with American activism is that unfortunately it's then sucked into the electoral process. And so in Madison, instead of sort of sticking to the ground and staying with sort of grassroots organizing, resistance, direct action, strikes, that was filtered into a recall campaign for Wisconsin's governor of Scott Walker. So the Democrats and the large unions in the United States sometimes operate particularly in a non-progressive fa fa fashion, especially the major labor unions. Uh, many of whom we call uh, sort of business unionism. Uh, this, it's not really tied to social justice activism. It's not really tied to social justice at all. It's more of this idea of how much money can we make per hour and do we have benefits and is our union taken care of? And as long as our union is taken care of, then you know the rest of the working class can kind of go away. But there are also progressive elements within the labor movement who have started to take leadership roles. So I do see positive elements there. Uh, right now in the United States, uh, one of the bigger actions and that we're trying to connect as well is obviously global warming and the environmental crisis. Talking about this in the United States is very difficult because of course right now with the tar sands pipeline, I think that's providing jobs for people at a time again when the United States economically is hurting. And it's the same with natural gas fracking. Um, but what these communities are finding out is that in the short term they're getting jobs, but in the long term uh, their groundwater is destroyed, their soil is destroyed, their natural environment is destroyed, uh, and some of it is irreparable damage. Um, so the, there are folks organizing around those issues in a very serious way. Uh, 350.org just held the biggest climate protest that we've had in the United States. There's close to 45, 50,000 people there. But again, we're stuck with two political parties. Uh, so so the difficulty in the electoral process is trying to find a way to gain power and make those decisions on a national level, whereas locally in states like Vermont we have, uh, you know, socialists and Green Party folks and communists, and but that's it's very marginalized to sort of geographical regions within the United States. Uh, Vermont being one, another one would be of course San Francisco, Northern California. Oregon, Washington, where there's a lot of very radical environmental actions happening. Um, direct actions, there's environmental groups that are um, blowing up fracking sites right now. Um, so that's, those kinds of things are happening. There are organizations that are, I think, supportive of that. But again, it's a very, it's a very small minority. And the problem with those actions right now is that we have, because of the economy, many people who are workers, part of the working class, 
who feel like this is an attack on their way of making a living and so forth. So it's been very difficult to build those broad coalitions at a time when people just want a job. With all that being said, I also do a weekly radio program. Uh, so in the community, it has sort of a 60 mile radius. We have a few thousand people who listen every week and I interview anyone from activists to organizers to intellectuals on the left. Uh, so we routinely have folks like uh, Vandana Shiva on the program and David Harvey and Noam Chomsky and all those sorts of folks come on the program. Uh, so it's really neat. It gives me an opportunity and a platform to sort of not only try and educate folks, but the flip side to this is also how do we tie folks into doing work on the ground. So for the first hour of the program, I'll usually interview a left intellectual, and then in the second hour of the program, I'll usually interview activists and organizers, people who are on the ground uh, doing this sort of work. With all of that, I came to Australia because I was able to be a part of a documentary film called On the Bridge. Uh, it's a film that follows seven returning servicemen and women and a family whose son had committed suicide when he returned home. That film was accepted to the Big Picture Film Festival here in Sydney, which I guess is the first film festival that focuses uh, strictly on social justice issues. I guess that's ever happened in Sydney, from what I've been told from the festival organizers. Um, I just really wanted to meet up with folks anywhere I travel, even if it's uh, outside the United States, I make it a point to meet with activists and organizers and people who are doing this work. So I have to say it's a pleasure to be in a room with you folks. And uh, I want to thank you for inviting me here.